And the first lesson in the New Testament is entitled, In the Fullness of Time. The New Testament is a very exciting study, as all of you know. It is a rich and a powerful book. You've committed yourself to X number of hours of homework and class time, discipling time. And as we go into this course, I can tell you that we want this class to be a good class period. We want these two hours to be blessed and guided and empowered by God's Spirit. And we'll be praying that way, and I'll be studying in that way. But I gotta tell you something. I know that the power that I have seen in this course in years past, when people have said, my life has been changed. God has done something in my life that has really been good as we've gone through the months of this study. That the real power rests with you and God alone together in your homework. That's really where the power is, I believe. See, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, the Word of God is full of living power. Now that's the New Living Translation of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The King James said, the Word of God is quick and powerful. Quick means alive. And if we believe that's true, and I fully believe it is true, then we cannot be the same people if we are for real with spending time every week doing the reading assignment as prescribed in your schedule and you precede that with prayer and with an expectant spirit that God in fact will be with you and speak to you and minister to you. See, in Ephesians chapter 6 it clearly states that the Holy Spirit attends God's Word. It says that the Word is the sword of the Spirit. Now if that is true, and I know it is, then the most powerful time will happen in your homework. And so don't fudge on your homework. That's where the power is. Now sometimes people say, well, you said it's going to take uh, four or five hours of homework. Uh, not for me. I, I've had a lot of these stories in the gospel in Sunday school. And I've read through the New Testament parts here and there. And uh, it'll be a piece of cake. I can speed read right through these assignments. <coughs> Let me tell you not to do that. Now you may know quite a bit about the New Testament. But there are two reasons why it would be a mistake for you to try to speed read instead of reading meditatively. You and I, as we go through the New Testament in the coming months, are not the same people that we were the last time we read those passages. We're in a different place in our pilgrimage. And so that means that we're new people, we're different people, when we come to that passage of Scripture, even though you may have underlined a passage before, that passage still has potential for God to use to work in your life because you're not quite in the same place as you were before. The second reason is that the Bible is the sword of the Spirit. It is alive and powerful, as Hebrews 4.12 states. That means that God may cause a section of the Bible that you read today to come alive and to be powerful in your life in a way that is different and perhaps much more alive than the last time. See, Jesus said the Holy Spirit is like the wind. It blows where it wills. So who are we to say that God's Holy Spirit will not cause some passage, some study that you do now to really come alive and be powerful in your life when perhaps it was not so the time before. See, that's the potential that God puts before us 
as we go into our New Testament study. Another thing that students sometimes say to me, as a matter of fact, uh, it was brought to my attention uh, by a student this week, and a very conscientious student. And uh, the comment was this, I, I, I get frustrated with the study of the Bible because there's so much there and I can't retain but just a fraction of it. Well, I can identify with that because I have that same feeling. But a professor some years ago allayed my frustration and I want to share the story he gave to me. It's a story that you may have heard before, but several in the class here have not, so I'm going to repeat it. It's a story about a father and a son, and the father said to the son, son, take this basket and go to the well and draw me a basket of water. So the son did it, and you know what happened. Uh, the wicker basket didn't hold the water. And so the father said a second time and a third time and a fourth time, go back and draw some more water. Finally, the son said in frustration, but father, I have no water when I get back to you. Almost all of it is drained out. And the father said to the son, look at the basket, my son, it's clean. Now that reminds me of John chapter 15, verse 3, where Jesus said, you are made clean through the word. He was saying to his disciples that they already, through the nearly three years of ministry where he had been teaching them, that they already had much cleaning that had happened in their life, being made clean or being pruned through the power of the word. And so the object, we should always remember, is not to amass head knowledge merely. Now we're interested in growing in learning things, but we're going to lose some of those things simply because retention isn't always that great. Our object is not head knowledge, our object is life change. Our object is coming closer to the Lord being made clean. That's what we want to see. <laughs> That's what makes this worthwhile, see. That's what turns me on. We're not eggheads, we're servants who want to serve the Lord and want to be changed more and more into his likeness. And that's the object of what the study is all about. Well, <clears throat> with that as an introduction to give all of us an encouragement to make the most of our New Testament study, I want to take a few minutes now to bring us up to date. Our last time together, we were in the Old Testament. And we studied about uh, Azurubabal and the building of the temple. We talked about uh, Darius who had given them the edict that said that the Old Testament people could return back uh, to the Holy Land and they can rebuild the temple. And uh, we read about Ezra, the, the one who was uh, a great teacher of the law. And we read about Nehemiah, a great leader. And uh, that's where we finished. And now we're ready to open up the pages of the Bible to the New Testament. Friends, there's 400 years there. 400 years, what happened? And so the homework that you had on the reading of the brief uh, historical sketch uh, helps to fill in the historical data. But what I wanna do is to take a couple of minutes on a few other things. The first thing I wanna have us think about and focus together is a person who had a marked influence that lasted into the New Testament era and that person is Alexander the Great. Now you've read a few things about Alexander the Great but I want to bring a couple of human interest items about him and about his life that I think will help you uh, to retain a sense of who Alexander the Great was. He was born in 356 BC, so he comes on the stage of history at the very beginning of the intertestamental period, okay? In the world book that we have as an encyclopedia in our home, the article in Alexander the Great says this, quote, 
Alexander the Great was one of the most remarkable men in all of human history. So let's take a look at some of the things that are remarkable about Alexander. His father was Philip, Philip of Macedonia. Now, if you can envision where Greece is, and if you think of the upper part of Greece and what would be probably the lower part of Bulgaria today, you're dealing with a large territory that in Bible times, or at least in this intertestamental period, was called Macedonia. Fairly large area geographically. Philip was his father, and he was the ruler. He was the general of the army and the administrator, and he was a very skillful administrator and a very courageous general. That's Philip, the father. Olympia was his mother, and we read that she was brilliant and that she was hot-tempered. What a combination. <laughs> and she said to young Alexander, your father has divine ancestry. And you know, we're living in the era, this intertestamental period, where Greek mythology was flourishing. And if you have dipped into any of this literature, you know it's just got a, a lot of exciting tales in it and you have important figures. Philip's ancestor, she got Alexander to believe, was Hercules. And if you ever see statues with a, a person who's full of <laughs> strength, that's Hercules. And so that explained to young Alexander why his father was strong, a strong leader, and a courageous person. And Olympia said, Alexander, you have divine ancestry. Your ancestor is Achilles. And if you've read any of Greek mythology, you know that Homer wrote the Iliad. And Achilles is the star in the Iliad. And young Alexander, one writer says, memorized the Iliad and carried it with him for the rest of his life. Whether that's legend or truth, I'm not sure. But the story of Achilles is this. You know, this is Greek mythology. The mother of Achilles took him as a baby, took him by the heel, and dipped him into the river Styx. That's that's a, a, a powerful river in Greek mythology. And the promise that was given by the gods was that he would be invincible because the water from the river Styx would make him invincible. And so he went out into the war and they were fighting the, the Trojan War. And, and sure enough, he was invincible until a, straight, a stray arrow came along and guess what? It hit him in the heel where his mother had held him while she dipped him into the river Styx. That part didn't get wet. And that is where he was vulnerable. That's why you get that statement. Uh, if you have a particular weakness, the <laughs> statement is made, that is my Achilles heel. Well, the, 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 the real upshot of all of this talk and all of this being imbued with having uh, divine ancestry was to give uh, Alexander a sense of destiny and a sense of greatness. And he began to dream dreams and uh, uh, his father brought in Aristotle of all people. Aristotle lived in this era, and he came from the lower part of Greece up to Macedonia for four years to be the tutor for Alexander. And he told him all about uh, philosophy and the contribution that Greece had to make to the world. And he turned Alexander into an avid Hellenizer. So his mission was to conquer the world in order that he could propagate Hellenism, the Greek way of life, the Greek customs, the Greek way of thinking, Greek literature. 
he felt that that was the greatest gift that the world could receive and he was going to be sure that the world would receive it. Uh, very quickly I want to mention one other little incident about the young Alexander. He, he did a lot of things to increase his physical strength. He was a disciplined person who uh, went to the gymnasium and, and he knew that he needed a strong body. And so here you've got a guy who's got a lot of courage. He is not tall, he's a short in stature. But if you're going to be a war leader, you've got to have a war steed. And so uh, cavalry was very, very important uh, for armies. They had foot shoulders, but also people on horse. And so wild horses would roam the countryside, and there was one horse that went like the wind and was high-spirited and could not be caught. And Alexander said, I will catch that horse. And he corralled the horse and he tamed the horse. He named his horse of uh, Bucephalus. And that became his war steed that carried him the great distance of the empire that he conquered all the way into the fringes of India. Now, if you want to take your Bibles and go to the very back map you have a map there that is called the Middle East Today. And uh, just to get an idea as to the extent of the territory that uh, Alexander amassed in his empire, you take a look at where Greece is in the upper left-hand corner. The last map, the last map in your Bible. It's called Israel and the Middle East Today. So this is a contemporary map of the Middle East. Do you see where Greece is? Okay. Now, if you follow that from the left-hand side and move to the east, to the right, and you go beneath the Black Sea, and you see where the Holy Land is and where Egypt is, and then you move on up north a bit into Iran, and you go below the Caspian Sea and then on. If this map went a little bit further, you would have a little uh, blue uh, marker indicating the Indus River, the fringe of India. That marks the eastern boundary of the territory that Alexander amassed as his empire. Now, friends, this looks like a kind of a small piece of paper here in the back. But let me tell you, all the way from Macedonia on to the Indus River is 3,000 miles. That's like from the Atlantic to the Pacific in the United States. No one heretofore had amassed an empire of that size. And of course, the biggest foe he had to deal with was Darius, not Darius I, uh, the Persian name that we study in the Old Testament, but Darius III. They call him Darius in India. That could well be. But at any rate, that is the size of the empire. Let me give you one last little anecdote about Alexander, this avid Hellenizer. I mean, he wanted to conquer. And we're going to see that the symbol used in the Bethel series, where we have teaching pictures, uh, the symbol for him is the sword. You see it on the teaching picture. And we'll talk about that in the second half of our time together. But he wasn't just a man of the sword. He was a man who was a Hellenizer. And he was interested in establishing libraries. He didn't just bring soldiers, he brought teachers, he brought learning resources. He wanted the people to know what Greek literature was about, Greek customs. He wanted them to dress like the Greeks did. He wanted them to have the kind of plays that the Greeks had in their theaters, all of that cultural aspects. And so that's the kind of a man he was. Now, he was also a drinker. And it is sad to say 
that when he had really extended his empire and uh, spending time uh, with the troops waiting for their next move, he and his close friend Clytus got into a drunken brawl. And Alexander, in a fit of rage, killed his closest friend. And when I read that, a verse from the book of Proverbs came to my mind. And uh, it's the 16th chapter of the book of Proverbs. He who rules his own spirit is greater than he who takes a city. Now that's how God looks at it. History has accorded him the name great. God indicates he who rules his own spirit is greater than he who takes a city. Well, he established his headquarters in Babylon and he was a skilled administrator. He had good control of that whole empire, but he caught a fever, probably malaria, and he died at age 33. He began when his father was uh, murdered and Alexander was age 22. From age 22 to age 33, the amassing of an empire. Now, we're going to take a look at the influence of Alexander. But if uh, you ever get to Alexandria, that place in Egypt that was obviously named after him, and frankly, if you can find an old map, you'll find many, many cities called Alexandria. Uh, when his horse died, he built a city and called it Bucephala, after his horse, in memory of his horse. Many places were called Alexandria, but none could measure Alexandria that still stands today in Egypt. And it was a central place of learning as well as commerce. And that's where his remains were moved and that's where his tomb is established. So, now why did I take this time uh, uh, to deal with Alexandria? Alexander the Great was a Hellenizer and he brought Hellenistic thinking into all that part of the world. And that is the thinking milieu into which the world of Christ is now introduced and against which and in which the New Testament writers take their place. And we must have some understanding of Hellenistic thinking Maybe some of you have had courses in uh, uh, ancient history, and then you would have studied these ancient philosophers. But uh, what I want you to do at this time is to uh, uh, take the sheet that uh, is in your, your packet of sheets called Hellenistic Thought and Hebraic Thought Contrasted. <coughs> That's the sheet. All right. On the left-hand side, I give seven characteristics of Hellenistic thought. And the right-hand column is blank. And what I want you to do is to go to work and to write in on your study sheet the contrasting parallel of Hebraic thought that corresponds to the Hellenistic thought. Now, the first one is very easy, and I'll give that as an example. Here's how it would go. Hellenistic thought is polytheistic. And what does that mean? It means that they believe there's got to be lots of gods. And when Paul came to Athens to preach, he said, I notice that you've got statues for a whole number of gods. And you've got a statue there for the unknown god, just in case you've missed one. And I want to tell you about that one. Now, obviously, through the study of the Old Testament, we know that the Hebrew believers were solid rock monotheists. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. <laughs> right out of the Ten Commandments. 
monotheism, very, very important cornerstone of the Hebraic Christian thought. Well, that gives you a, a sample as to what we want you to do now as you go to your study sheet. Take your sheets that you worked on with regard to Hellenistic thought and Hebraic thought contrasted. And let's walk through that and I'll uh, give you some thoughts and see how it matches what you put on your paper in your own work group. We already did number one, the polytheistic, monotheistic contrast. We go to number two. In the Greek world, the gods were unfeeling and impersonal. And you already know that Old and New Testament uh, put that aside and saying that's not the kind of God that we relate to as believers. The Old Testament believers had a sense that God was a personal God. Now that's refined and made more specific, obviously, in the New Testament where Jesus said, you know, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven. Well, that's very intimate and personal. That's a parental tie. And parental ties at their best, you know, are very special. And Jesus was in effect saying, that's how God relates to you. Jesus went on to say in the passage in John on the Good Shepherd, he said, I am the Good Shepherd and I know my sheep and know them by name. Another strong allusion to the sense that God is a personal God and the book of Hebrews went on to say he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was in all points stepped like as we are accepting he didn't sin. He knows what it's about to live here on terra firma. So that's the kind of an intimate, personal, knowing, feeling God uh, we worship. Well, that was a point of contrast and clash. Item number three, emphasis on reason. So the Greeks produced, you know, ethicists and philosophers uh, like they were going on a style. I mean, you just take a study in ancient uh, philosophy and <laughs> you come across all these Greek names. And they come out of this period. This is the period of Plato and Socrates and Aristotle, just to name a few of the heavyweights. And the emphasis is on using your noggin. Be a philosopher king, as Plato put it. And when you come to Hebraic thought, the emphasis is not so much on human reason, although God gave us that kind of gift, but it has limitations. Can man by searching find out God? Writes the Old Testament writer, and the answer in the book of Job is, it's a rhetorical question. The answer implied is, no, you cannot, by reason, figure God out or find out what he's like. And so the emphasis in the Hebraic thinking world is God has made himself known. God has revealed himself in the word written and in the word made flesh, namely his son Jesus Christ. So the emphasis is not on reason, the emphasis is on revelation. Let's go on. Confidence is placed in philosophy. The authority figures in the Greek world and in Hellenistic thinking were these people. They were the people that, uh, well, in the financial world they say when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. I'm not sure if that's still true, but in the Hellenistic world, when the philosopher and ethicist speak, people listen. <laughs> All right. Now, what is there in the Hebraic sense that takes a contrasting point of view? When God speaks, people need to listen. Jesus said, it is written. And when he said it, the, there was no question but what that was the ultimate authority. And he was quoting the Old Testament. 
So the emphasis is not on uh, books written by human authors. Uh, the emphasis is on God's revelation in writing. And so now you go to item number five, worldliness, live it up. As one uh, uh, ethicist put it, eat, sleep, and be merry because tomorrow you die. I mean, this is it. There is nothing else. So live it up. And uh, the, the biblical writers talked about the fact that if fullness of life is following the Lord. In Him is fullness of life and joys forevermore. And so it was to follow God's pattern for your life. He's the one who made you in His image. He knows what life is about. He has the best way. So piety, uh, according to God's plan for your life, was the accent in Hebraic thinking. Item number six, the glorification of man. Man is a central focus. Now, if you take a look at the Greek influence that moved on from this era into the Renaissance period when sculptors and artists like Michelangelo had their heyday, you take a look at the statue of David. Boy, is he muscular and strong. That tells you what they thought of man. You go to the Sistine Chapel and you look at the ceiling and here you have a portrayal of Adam and your portrayal of God. And it's a, a wonderful portrayal. Do you know that those two figures are the same size? That tells you something about their sense of the glorification of human life. Now, when you get into Hebraic teaching and thinking, it's the glorification of God the glorification of God. Now to be sure, God made man in his image, a little lower than the angels. And he crowned him with all of the endowments and gave him a responsibility. But always remember that in scripture, God is the creator and we are the creatures. God is the sovereign and we are the subjects. And we do not push God aside and put man on a pedestal above him or equal to him in any way. Our greatness is in God's grace. Our greatness is in God's grace. All right, and this follows and concludes very naturally with the fact that Greek and Hellenistic thinking is humanistic. Man can make it on his own. And the Hebraic thought is no way. You cannot live well or die well without God. It is a fool who thinks that he can, the Bible says. And so the Hebraic thinking is theistic. Man is dependent. And the sooner we learn that, the better off we're going to be. Man is dependent, meaning that in the generic sense. Okay, with that as a review and uh, giving a, a sense that you know, Alexander did have an impact <laughs> and it lives today. And it was especially an alive milieu in the time of Christ and in the time of the New Testament writers. So we need to know he sets the stage for it. Now take the sheet that is called the Apocrypha. This is literature that grew up in the intertestamental period. And we'll take a few minutes to take a look at this because people typically have a question. It's not in my Bible, but I have a friend uh, that goes to the Roman Catholic Church and it's in their Bible. And why is that? And what value is this? And how should we look at it? And I have a copy here uh, called the Apocrypha. <coughs> And, uh, but it, it is in, not in most of the Bibles in my study. Just a couple of the Bibles have it in them. And so it is not uh, found typically among Protestants. Why is that? How does this come about? Well, the Apocrypha consists of about 12 or 13 books, depending on how you number them. Some of it is history, 
and is valuable for learning something about the whole Maccabean uh, revolution and first and second Maccabe Maccabees would be valuable historically. It's got uh, wisdom literature in it, kind of like reading the book of Proverbs. So there's a lot of good little gems of wisdom along the line there. And there is religious fiction in it, uh, things that uh, are fanciful. Now, the early Christian church, the church fathers showed that they were familiar with the Apocrypha. Some thought it was good stuff, others didn't and they said well it's okay to read but uh, they didn't give it a high standing. The one notable reference in the New Testament to the Apocrypha is found in the book of Jude and uh, in the book of Jude you have a statement uh, from the book of Enoch and it's found in verse 14. Look, the Lord is coming with thousands of his holy ones. He will bring the people of the world to judgment. He will convict the ungodly of all evil things they have done in rebellion and of all the insults that godless sinners have spoken against him. That's a quotation from the book of Enoch. Now, we move on in history from the early Christian period. Uh, by the way, the Apocrypha was not in the Hebrew Bible. I, that says something to me, and I think it's worth noting that the Hebrew scrolls did not include the Apocrypha. When the Old Testament got translated into Greek, and that was called the Septuagint, we'll look at that a little bit later, uh, it did include the Apocryphal books between the two testaments. Okay, now let's go to the Reformation period. 1517, Martin Luther edited a Bible and it did not include the Apocrypha. And he, in effect, along with several other uh, the leaders said, several of the teachings in the church of that day, such as the teaching on purgatory, prayers for the dead, salvation by works, merit of the saints, are not found in the 66 books. I, I had a chance to talk with uh, um, a Roman Catholic uh, young man uh, preparing for the priesthood and about a couple of these things and, and they look at a few allusions in the Old Testament and then uh, a couple in the New Testament, but it's a stretch in my sense to find it there. Uh, but you can find uh, more specific stuff uh, on purgatory, even though the word mm -hmm. isn't mentioned, uh, but you've got the, the concept in uh, the Apocrypha. And uh, I can show you what passages to look at if you are interested in digging into that. But that is the reason why the Reformers did not accept the Apocrypha. They said, any doctrine needs to be clearly taught in the canonical books, the 66, and the, you can read these other books for the historical value, but never base a doctrine except it be taught also in the Holy Scripture. And uh, the Westminster Confession states that, the Anglican uh, books state that, and that is where we come down in our particular time with regard to those books that are called extra canonical apocryphal books and they are not found in most of our Bibles. Take your study sheets by the same name in the fullness of time, study number one, and let's go through the basic concepts that we have in the Bethel series in uh, this study and follow the uh, pictorial uh, picture that gives us uh, the artist's way of reminding us what uh, 11 basic teachings that come out of this particular study. So the first item that we look at in the picture is the hourglass. The hourglass reminds us of that teaching found in the New Testament 
uh, found in Galatians uh, 4, 4 and 5. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. And so the hourglass is a very fit symbol of the concept that there is a fullness of time feeling about the coming of Christ. It, it wasn't haphazard. It wasn't that God suddenly woke up one morning and said, hey, this looks like a good day to send Jesus Christ in human flesh and uh, live on planet Earth for some 33 years. No, 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 no. There's a sense of a divine timetable. And the hourglass means that the sands of time had run out according to God's plan and the preparation time was now complete. And the moment struck. Jesus himself said when he came preaching, he said, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Mark 1, 15. Now I have in my hand here uh, a valuable little book called The Life and Teachings of Jesus Christ. It's by James S. Stewart. Not to be confused with a book with a similar title by James Stalker. And in order for you to get uh, the insight that Stewart has on the fullness of time concept, I've asked Robert to read a paragraph from this book. Search the pages of history up and down, and in all the tale of the centuries, you will not find any generation in which Christ could better have come than just the generation in which he did come. There is a tide, says Shakespeare, in the affairs of men. We can go beyond that and say that there is a tide in the affairs of God. And it is when that tide reaches the flood, when all the preparatory work is done and world conditions are clamoring for it and human souls are open, it is then, at the flood tide hour of history, that God launches his new adventure. Thank you, Robert, for that reading. Now we'll go to the second teaching that is highlighted in this study. Uh, the hourglass was the first one, and the sword <coughs> on the top of that pillar is the second item. This is the artist's way of reminding us of who? Alexander the Great. The weapon of choice, a sword. And Alexander the Great we've already talked about. And we simply want to underscore the fact here that he made a tremendously important impact on the culture of that day. And we have to have a sense of that in order to uh, have a grasp of the New Testament and what it was written to and, and how the people were confronted with that particular kind of thinking. In the world book that I referred to, uh, the article on Alexander the Great makes this closing quote. This great king and general helped make the spread of Christianity possible 400 years after his time. End of quote. That from a secular book. Alexander the Great was used of the Lord to do some things that we're going to look at in this study that really prospered and enabled the spread of the, of the gospel to go forth. So I put a mark on the negative side for Alexander the Great in terms of him being a Hellenizer and that that thought was really kind of in contrast to a lot of the biblical teachings. But on the other side of the ledger, that sword does represent the fact that he put together an empire that uh, um, stood the missionaries in good stead. And let's take a look at some of the individual ways in which that's true. All right, the first thing we want to take note of is the fact that uh, on, underneath that sword is a pillar, and that pillar stands for Greek architecture. Greek culture, as a matter of fact, and architecture was a part of the Greek culture. All you need to do is to go uh, uh, to look at pictures or to visit in person and go to Corinth and you'll see the Temple of Apollo 
and you see those uh, Greek columns still standing. Or you go to Athens, and of course you've all seen pictures of the, of the Parthenon. And there's more than pillars there. There's quite a bit of, uh, of the rest of the building standing, and it's a tribute to the greatness of the construction, but also the artistic uh, value of Greek architecture. Well, it was Alexander's dream and his passion. Now, you can put it down that when you come across people who make a difference, they are people who have a passion. And it's best, of course, if that is a God-given passion. Now, I can't say that about Alexander, but he had a passion to spread the whole culture and literature and thinking of the Hellenistic world. Because heretofore, it was, you know, kind of locked up there in a small place called Greece. And now he took it and he spread it throughout the empire. So Greek culture uh, was a thing that Alexander really put on the scene. Now, what difference does that make? Did that serve in an advantageous way for the Christian missionaries? And I want to tell you, if you have studied anything about cross-cultural mission, you'll say, wow, wow, what an advantageous thing. Because every group of people tends to get their own culture. Any region live together long enough and they get a certain way of doing things, a certain way of thinking, a certain way of looking at life, and that's the culture of that region. Now when a missionary comes into that from the outside as a foreigner and they are not really acquainted with that culture, they're like with all thumbs, a bowl in a china shop type of person trying to rub shoulders with these people that they're trying to share the good news with. And the people that are there kind of think the missionaries out in left field because they just aren't with it. So culture makes a difference. Now, Alexander had spread a common cultural bond, a common way of looking at life, a common language, as we'll look at in a minute. And now the missionaries could go and they could be one of these people because now they had a common terminology, they had a common frame of reference when they talk about the Olympian games, when they talked about uh, other things that were a part of the Greek culture, they, people all knew uh, what it was about. And so let me tell you that a homogenous culture is a tremendous asset for people to go cross-culturally into foreign lands and to say, yeah, they've got some things that are unique to their own region, but we still have this transcending common bond of a common reference and culture. And that was the Hellenistic way of life. So put down a plus that that was something that God used in a very special way. Now, for those of you who may have looked at the Greek alphabet sometime or other, you'll notice that these letters on the bottom refer to the language. The Greek language was what the people were taught in all the regions of the empire. And it came to be the common language of the street and of commerce. And if you really wanted to get along in society and in the business world, you needed to know Greek. So people became bilingual. They had the, region, the language of their own uh, region, but they also had Greek. Now, no one here needs to be told what an advantage that is to a missionary. It takes a couple of years to learn a language of another foreign tongue. And I'll tell you, you really aren't accepted well as a person who comes there to share the good news if you murder the language of the people. They're offended by that. It makes a barrier between what you've got to say and their receptivity to take it in. So now, 
they could take the language. Now there's two kinds of Greek. There's classical Greek, and when you read Aristotle and Euripides and Plato and so forth, you read classical Greek, unless it's translated. But there was another kind of Greek. It was called Koine Greek. It was the language very similar to classical Greek, but it was the language just a bit different. It was the language of the street. It was the language of the schools. It was not the language of the scholars, but it was the common language of the people. Now guess which kind of Greek the New Testament was written in? It was written in the language of the common people. And when the, the Old Testament, namely the Septuagint, was translated into Greek, because you see the uh, Hebrew people were scattered all over. And anytime you had 10 families, you could start a synagogue. And then they would get the scrolls, and so there would be teaching there. Well, it didn't take long, and the people said, we don't understand Hebrew anymore. Get lost with your Hebrew scrolls. Put it in Greek so we can understand it. And so in Alexandria, in Egypt, there was in about 250 BC, about 70 scholars that translated the first five books of the Bible, and then later on the rest of the Old Testament was translated as well, and that came to be called the Septuagint. And so the Septuagint was uh, very much around and was uh, very much used in the synagogues. And the Roman numeral for the Septuagint is LXX. If you ever come across that in your reading, you'll know that that stands for 70. And uh, that obviously comes from the fact that they believe 70 scholars did the work. And they even uh, went on to say it only took them 70 days, but uh, be that as it may. So, a world language. And that was tremendously helpful. Now, the other item on the bottom of this page has to do with this scroll. And that refers to the Old Testament scrolls, the Old Testament books of Isaiah and of Genesis, etc., were in scroll form, and they are called the Hebrew traditions. So wherever there was a synagogue, they would have some of those scrolls. Now, how did that prepare for the time of Christ? All you have to do is to remember study number 17 of the Old Testament, a Messiah from the root of David. Where is that found? in the Old Testament, a birth of a new era. And so the synagogues and the people who attended there as they talked to their neighbors and shared with their friends began to talk about the fact the skies are dark, there's a lot of bad things going on in the world, but a new day is coming. God is going to send a Messiah onto the scene. And so there was a sense of hope there was a sense of expectation. There is something that's going to happen, and it's going to make life better. God is going to intervene. So the Old Testament scrolls had a large part to play in building that sense of expectancy and that sense of, of longing. When is God going to bring this marvelous change in, in life and uh, so that's a highly significant aspect. And, uh, you know, I asked the question, you know, here we are New Testament people. We've got not only the Old Testament, but the New Testament. Are we people of good news? Are we people that have a sense of excitement and expectation as to what God will be doing and is doing in the world today? Or are we kind of down in the mouth and dour so that people who visit and rub shoulders with us, kind of say, well, they're not too exciting to be around. Uh, they kind of drag you down. They're always pessimistic. No, no, no. Gospel, by definition, means good news. That's what that word means. And so there needs to be that same kind of expectancy and faith dimension and hope and joy that these synagogues, through the Old Testament scrolls, imbued in the parts where they had influence. And that played a part in making the world ready 
for the good news to come. Well, I want to look at one other thing here, and that has to do with this eagle. The eagle is a sign of Roman unity. And uh, the one world concept that Alexander had in mind really did happen. And then pieces of history came along, and Roman generals began to take over and get more power. And so when the time of Christ arrived, it was Rome who ruled the world. And there was a sense of one-worldness or unity among the world. One large empire. So my discussion question for you as we break to discuss is the question listed on the bottom of that page, number six. How did world unity facilitate the spread of the gospel? You've got to put your thinking caps on for this one. No longer do we have individual city-states or regions, each with their own power, each with their own boundaries. Now we've got one unified empire, a Roman empire to be sure, ruled with an iron fist, but a united empire nonetheless. All right, let's take our break and talk about that. I'm interested to know what, what you did with that question. But I heard talk about the fact that if you have a united empire and you don't have individual barriers between city, states, and regions, that the need for passports is gone. Hey, <laughs> no more visas. And you can move freely from one section to another section like we do in our own country between California and, and, uh, and any other state in the nation, see. Now you need uh, some kind of visa if you go into some other countries, but the empire had no need for restricting free travel. And friends, that's an asset. That is really a boon. Who put that together? <laughs> the Lord is the God of history. So let's move on to the white flag that we see in the mouth of that eagle, and that refers to uh, peace. It was a forced peace under the hard rule of Rome, but it was peace nonetheless. When are people most open to the gospel? when there's ethnic cleansing and when there's war going on and you've got to think about survival and safety or when there's peace and you've got time to think about spiritual things. It's the latter, isn't it, typically, although there is foxhole religion. Nonetheless, generally speaking, people are ready to hear about the good news when they don't have to hide for their life. So this was an era of peace. Now, we come to the Colosseum and the roads that all intersect and end up at the Colosseum. That obviously refers to Rome. And the saying was, all roads lead to Rome. And the statement that Stuart makes at this point about the road system that uh, the Roman laborers put together really bears repeating in your hearing. So I'd like to have Robert read that section now. From end to end of the empire, the great highways ran, triumphs of Roman engineering, and the 10,000 laborers who had toiled on the making of the roads in the sweat of their brows little thought they were preparing a way for the Son of God, but they were. Along these imperial lines of communication, built to carry Caesar's legions to every corner of his dominions, the missionaries of the gospel came marching, and everywhere their message spread like wildfire. Christ's men could never have evangelized the world as they did if it had not been for the Roman roads. We move now to another part of the picture. Down at the bottom, you've got three people. And one of, this, uh, uh, one of these individuals stands there with clasped hands, as though he's wringing his hands in utter confusion. And that's the artist's way of symbolizing what prevailed in that era. There were all kinds of gods. There were all kinds of philosophies. 
And there were many, many voices that were beckoning for their attention and saying, subscribe to this belief. Follow this way. Here's where it's at. And in the midst of that cacophony of sound, all bidding for their attention, saying, this is what you need to believe, the people were in utter confusion. We're living in a day very similar, writers tell us, to the first Christian century and to this particular era that this picture portrays. We've got a lot of faiths, religions, that are around them out in our neighborhoods. They're not distant anymore. They're here. Their children go to our schools. Their uh, edifices are found in our neighborhoods. They're a part of us as a pluralistic society. And we need to ask ourselves the question, and this is what I want you to discuss. This is the question. If I were in the place of making a choice between the various religious faiths that are round about, what would guide me in making my choice? That's the question. It's a very important question. And I want you to break up in your discussion groups and really give that a going over. And I want to pick up where we left off, where we had that very significant question. What would guide you in making your choice among the various types of religions and faiths that are round about? And uh, what I want to do by way of summary is just tell you the bottom line in terms of my own belief system. This is how I look at it. And I would uh, like to go back to a little story. It's a true story as it's reported to me about Karl Barth, a reformed theologian who died oh, a couple of decades ago, but uh, has written uh, ponderously and voluminously on Christian doctrine. Yeah, read his stuff and it's not bedtime uh, reading, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, well, at any rate, he made a trip to the United States a number of years ago and he lectured at the University of Chicago. And the lecture uh, went on and on and, and it was all great stuff. But when he was finished, he had question and answer time and one person said, Dr. Bart, you have written all of these books on Christian doctrine and they are ponderous to read. But what is the bottom line? If you boil everything down and put it into something concise, what would it be? And Karl Barth said, the children's verse says it all. And it simply goes that Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And that was it. And friends, that's where it comes down for me. The real reason, I think, for us to say the Christian faith is where we want to be is because that's where the Scripture puts it. And you say, well, why do you say the Scripture is the North Star and the authority in terms of what we believe and don't believe? Well, there are many reasons, and when you get to the course on apologetics, you can go into that in depth, but let me just say for starters that one of the reasons during my college years that I began to, to say this book is a book that's going to be the North Star of my life was the attitude that Jesus Christ had toward Holy Scripture. He looked upon the Bible of his day, which was the Old Testament, as authoritative. It is written, he said. And I said to myself, if it's that authoritative for the Son of God, for Jesus Christ, then I'll take it and embrace it as the guide for my life as well. And so the classical statement of Christian theology is that the Holy Scriptures are the only rule of faith, what we believe and practice how we live. And that's the bottom line. I think Karl Barth said it very well. 
How do we know that Jesus loves us? How do we know that the gospel is true? The Bible tells me so. Now, there are other things that build onto that, but that's the bottom line, in my estimation. You're going to finish up on this study by looking at these two other figures. And let's take the figure with the upraised arm. And that's the fellow who says, I'm hungry. Nothing has really satisfied. It hasn't really delivered. And so that person says, enough is enough. We have seen the worst of it. Rack and rule. Moral decay. Whatever has been publicized hasn't delivered. We've got to have something better than this. So moral deterioration. And I ask the question, we've got those kind of evaluations and questions being asked in our society today. And there is a, a time when people are saying character does count and values do matter. And that expediency, just doing whatever happens to be to your advantage at that moment, isn't the way to go. There must be principles. There must be that which is from God himself, who created all of life and who knows how life is to be lived. That is what we need to live by. And so Jesus said, you are the light of the world to show the way. You're the salt of the earth to keep things from going putrid and from rack and ruin. That's the corollary, it seems to me, to this particular uh, person that you find here. And so what I'd like to do is to wrap up by uh, giving you a summary question that I put on the bottom of your worksheet. This question takes into account the whole study. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born of the law, to re redeem those that are under the law that we might receive the full rights as sons and daughters. What is the fullness of time? What does that tell us about God? What does that tell us about our, our view of, of history today? Well, that was the paper that you were to write on, and I'll be interested to read what you put there. But let me give you a couple of thoughts that come to me. First of all, a study like this that shows that God is in charge of history and that there is a timetable that God and only God knows tells us that history is his story. Ultimately, he is the one who is in control. It may not look like it always, but God is still sovereign. That's what this teaches us. Secondly, it teaches us that because God is in control and he has a plan and a purpose, that we need to be people of hope. We ought to be people who walk with a spring in our step and with a sense of hope and joy as we talked about, that uh, the people that are portrayed as the recipients and also the spreaders of hope and expectancy in the Hebrew scrolls, we need to be those kind of people. We can look at the darkness of the world and say that's not the last word. God has the last word and it is good. <laughs> and the last thing I want to say is that this study in its total scope teaches us that we need to be patient. The Bible tells us that God's time is not always our time. A day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years are at a day. And so we need to be people who are ready, people who are expectant and joyful, people who serve, but people who also recognize that we aren't the ones who hold that hourglass. That's God's job. And I think we should joyfully say, I'm glad that he is the one that is in charge because he is a good God. And I'm thankful to be a servant and a subject under his lordship at this point in history. Let's take that as our closing thought.